Food is very indulgent, but it can also be bright and made with clean ingredients, which is why we're talking with Simon Sakal to learn more about Soli. Welcome to The Produce Moms. This is the podcast where I talk to various people who've made an impact on the fruit and vegetable community. There are so many stories to share that will change the way you look at fresh produce. Welcome to the Produce Moms Podcast, Simon. We are so glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. We're going to dive into telling the story behind that pineapple jerky and everything that you've created at Soli. I can't wait for our audience to learn more about you, Simon. When I got to learn more about your background and your passion for starting this business, it was a very quick yes. We've got to get this man on the Produce Moms Podcast and tell this story. You have a tremendous background and the brand that you've made accessible for us all is a true favorite here at The Produce Mom. So please tell our audience a little bit more about what you've created. I've been doing this all my life, all my professional life. Um, I started doing this when I was at the university and I wanted to develop a new process to making fat-free potato chips. Uh, which I'll tell the story about that. And um, and that involved into fruit techs and then into Soli. And, and uh, I'm an industrial engineer. I live in San Diego, California. The company is here in La Jolla. And I've been living here for almost five years now. Uh, I'm originally from Mexico City. And that's where the biggest part of the company is right now. Well, I loved AFA. I lived in Mexico during college. I was a intercambio de estudiantes at la Universidad de Guanajuato. So I absolutely Ooh. enjoyed my time in Mexico. Yeah, we can't do the whole podcast in Spanish, Simon. I need a couple cervezas before I'm fluent again. But um, <laughs> <laughs> you're also going to love this. Uh, the first time I went to La Jolla, um, I called it La Jolla. So um, I am that Midwesterner <laughs> that mispronounced La Jolla. So Simon, I um, your background fascinates me. The first product that you created was the fruit jerky. And in my opinion, Soli was the consumer product that created a plant-based jerky solution for the masses. So your product was progressive. I know that there's other brands in the market now, other other similar products that make plant-based snacking as accessible and easy as Soli. But when I think about Soli, I think, okay, this is the original. This is the pioneer. This is the one that immediately grabbed the attention of retailers like Whole Foods, ended up in the trend reports. So please tell the story of how you thought the marketplace needs this. It's a very long story. It's a 20-year-long story because making something as simple as a one-ingredient product requires a huge effort. It, because the only way you can get a, a product to taste, like, like the fruit jerky tastes, with one ingredient is to be able to source and control the source of that ingredient. And when that ingredient is fresh produce, it's very difficult because it's even difficult for for me when I go to the supermarket to buy mangoes to pick the right ones. So imagine doing this with hundreds of metric tons of fresh produce per day. It's very, very difficult. And the only way to do that is work hand by hand with the farmers and create alliances and processes that helps us source that perfect product. So that's where it it all starts. Uh, Usually it's easier for any brand to just buy dehydrated products or uh, shelf stable ingredients and if it's not as sweet, just put a little bit of sugar or a dog current or if it's not as right, just put some color in. And so making a product that looks like this and tastes like this with one ingredient requires a huge amount of effort and, and, and a big vertical integration. So we, we do all that. We work with the farmers very, very closely, and I'll go into that uh, shortly. Then 
We invent and patent our own food processes. We invent the technologies, Lori. We have three worldwide patents on food processes on how to work with fresh produce to make these products shelf stable and convenient. And then we, we even manufacture our, our own man- machinery and have our plants. We have three manufacturing facilities in Mexico and one in Costa Rica because there's no other way to make product. I can't wait to learn more about your sourcing. Um, I have to ask you from a cultural side, uh, did your Latino culture inspire this product line? A lot of times when we talk to founders of different foods, they're like, oh, you know, this was something I enjoyed in my grandma's kitchen, or this was something that reminded me of my life, you know, growing up. Like how, what is the cultural side of Sully? Like, how are you connected to this product personally? I'm, I'm very connected because I, I really, really believe in clean food to my core. That's what I give my children. I'm, I'm, every time you open the news, there's a new ingredient that causes cancer or, or inflammation or it's, it's crazy how dangerous pesticides are and additives are. And I really believe that to my core. And, and that's how we eat at home. And that, that's one part. Uh, the other part is we are really, Big fruit eaters in Mexico and Latin America. Yes. I don't know if you remember in Guanajuato, there's the fruit cart all around. Yes. And, and people have access to fruit more than here. And, and they, it's very easy for a, for a eight year old boy to get some mango with chile at the corner of the street. Oh my gosh. I would get one. I would get one at 1 a.m. after, uh, after being at the club, that's when I would get mine. <laughs> Humans crave for sweet things. It's it's natural. It's what we want to eat. And, and we're programmed for that. And there's no better way to eat it than with fresh fruit and with fruit itself. So having access or, or giving access of that kind of pleasure and convenience and, and health to broad uh, consumer markets is a huge deal for us. So it does have a cultural aspect. And then we have some products with chili and, le- and lemon, and, and they're very, very good as well. Uh, but of course, eating fruit is, is part of who we are and how we grew since we were children. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll tell you, as a steward to the produce industry, you know, value chain, supply chain, and all of our industry insights, when we break down our shoppers at grocery retail by demographic, no shopper buys more fresh produce than the Latino community. And when you look at the uh, Soli website, which is Soli.com, S-O-L-E-L-Y.com, and you you check out their product lineup, folks. I mean, we're talking about also the the products that you're using, the the mango, the guava, or I guess I should say mango, guava, <laughs> the pineapple. It, these are these very much are are fruit varieties that also remind me of um, you know my time in in Mexico and Latin America. So it's. Uh, it, it's there. I think I feel like the culture comes through in a big way. So, like when I talk to you as the founder and learn more about your background, I'm able to immediately connect the dots. And that's one of my favorite things. I say it all the time on this show: food is culture, you know. And so it is. It's in a beautiful way to to bring your your culture to life and accessible for for so many. Um, all right. So you mentioned the the food technology that that you're part of. So. Uh, like the food technology and the innovations. So tell, I'd like to l- talk a little bit more about that. I think that people don't realize how much um, technology and innovation is, is present in food, uh, food products, agriculture, uh, food manufacturing, et cetera. So um, I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about the, the technology side of your brand. When we started this company more than 20 years ago, we, we understood that if you want to make something different, you need a completely different approach, as I just explained, just from the sourcing side, because all the food industry was created around make convenience about, and every process or most of the process says were created out of 
a shelf stable products to make an homogeneous final product that is shelf stable for a long time. So you you use a lot of flowers, a lot of sugars, a lot of preservatives, a lot. And it's not because the industry is bad. It's because it's the only way to have a, a bar with a two year shelf life that always stays exactly the same, that is very, very sweet. It's unnatural. So there's no other way to do it just to do it that way. So what the way we started this is how can we make a process that really gives us all the organoleptic uh, characteristics of the fruit, which is it smells like the fruit, it looks the color of the fruit, and it tastes like a fresh fruit. And right. uh, tropical fruits are special. Uh, uh, tropical fruits are a lot more sweet usually a lot more they're louder they're 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 more exciting they they have a lot more flavor than i don't know berries apples or cold weather fruit so so they're special in that way but they're also more difficult to work with because the sourcing like the bricks level for instance like that uh, there's typically a higher bricks level which is how we gauge the the sugar, the sweetness, the natural occurring sugar and sweetness in fruit is calculated by bricks. And that's B-R-I-X. And with tropical fruits, they're just naturally higher in that. That's why we crave them. That's why when you do a big fruit platter, the pineapple's always the first to go because it's the sweetest, you know? So um <laughs> but no, Simon, this is this is fascinating. So keep talking. I just want to make sure our audience understood that that connection, you know. That's exactly, exactly right. Working with high bricks fruits is difficult because first of all, the range of the amount of sugar that the fruit has, the natural fructose that it has, varies a lot. So when you process it, you get very different results. That That's one part. And the other part is when you're starting to take away some of the water, which is the only thing our processes do, reduce the water in the fruits, uh, if, the, if the bricks content is very high, it it gets it starts to get sticky or if the temperature gets high it caramelizes so it gets very dark very fast so it's a lot more difficult to work with so developing those processes were, was very hard because first we we needed so so let's talk about the fruit jerky first so to make the fruit jerky we had to develop a process on which we have we can control the bricks of the mango, let's say mango. You have to control the bricks level of the mango and the humidity and the color and everything of huge amounts of mango. And the only way to do that is work with the farmers. Uh, I'll go into that later. But that's part number one. And then we had to develop a process so mild that doesn't affect the, the taste and the smell of the product. So there's a lot of, of other, I don't know, fruit bars in the market that that were in before us or in and out. Or, and they're mostly apple-based. And you cannot taste the, the fruit because it's so, mu so much processed. What we do in our process is we cut the mango in little pieces and then it's like a cold pressing. It's a lot more technical than that, but it's like a cold pressing into a, a fruit jerky, into a, a strip that the only thing you lose is the water. And then you package it in, in this uh, vacuum sealed package to, to seal in all the flavor and the experience. So when you open the product, you can smell the pineapple, especially the pineapple. It smells very, very strong. There's no, there's no other product in the market that can do that because no one else has the, the, the vertical integration to source the perfect pineapple from Costa Rica, then process it with a special processing technology that doesn't affect 
the, 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 the taste and the smell and the organoleptic characteristics, and then pack it into this patented process uh, strip. So technology is a huge deal. Yeah. Yeah. And your vertical integration, to your point, being able to have that control and oversight of the entire process is also paramount in your ability to produce this product. It was very difficult to build because... How did you even have the... How did you fundraise it all? I mean, my gosh. How? I mean, that's crazy when you think you're funding the food innovation, the technology, forging those relationships with growers that are literally, you know, throughout this half of the world. I've been asked a, a lot about that because the usual path to entrepreneurship in food is having an idea uh, and then getting a co-manufacturer to do it. And then you have to fund product and marketing and, and of course, uh, team. But we started the other way around. We had to fund machines that we have to build. We have the four manufacturing facilities. We have around 1,500 people working with us all around the world. So it, it's a huge, huge operation. So it's been a, a very long process of funding with different, uh, very, very good investors that have worked with us uh, to get here. And um, and now we're in a, at a very, very special stage. But yeah, it, it was very demanding capital at the beginning because we needed to create something where nothing was there. It was not just go and co-manufacture a fruit product, a fruit-based product, which it was very difficult and very expensive and, and time-consuming, but it, it also gives us a huge moat around the company because even if you have a lot of money, it's very difficult to go and work with farmers, create these relationships, source all this product, and then we have patented technologies. So I think it's... It's the only way to really do it. it. It's it's walking the talk. It's not just saying, hey, we're clean and, and we're very nice to people. It's, we really do it. The Produce Moms is B Corp certified. So what you're saying is like filling my soul. You know, this is exactly what I love. We do need to take a quick break, Simon. But when we come back, folks, we are going to, um, I'm going to ask Simon some questions about the product sourcing and, and learn a little bit more about um, the farmers that he works with in the regions. Um, Simon, this has just been fabulous. Thank you very much, folks. Stay with us. We are with Simon, the co-founder and the CEO of Soli. So I'm officially obsessed with bare beans. This is a new produce department item, and you can look for bare beans now on shelf at Fresh Time. Bear beans are fresh, kettle-cooked beans sourced straight from the family farm. You might remember Michelle Huff, the founder of Bear Beans, from episode 195. Michelle, say hi to everyone. I'm Michelle Huff, the proud owner of Bear Beans. My family and I have been growing beans in Idaho for four generations. Bear Beans provides that scratch-made quality with more convenience than a can. No liquid, no salt, just beans. Bear Beans are the best way for us all to eat our plant-based protein. Look for Bear Beans now in the produce department at Fresh Time stores or visit bearbeans.com and use the store locator to find them near you. Bear Beans is proud to be a woman-owned, farmer-owned, and indigenous-owned business. Thank you to the Produce Moms community for your support. Now, back to today's episode. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Produce Moms Podcast. I'm Lori Taylor here with Simon Sakal. He's the co-founder and CEO at Soli. And oh my goodness, have I enjoyed learning more about how he created this brilliant product. Uh, I've talked about the pineapple jerky, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much that Soli represents. Um, before the break, we were talking about the vertical integration and all the hard work that Simon co-founders and, and everyone did to grow Soli into what it is. Simon, you said, did you say 1,500 employees at your at your business? Yep, more or less. And knowing that you have these four facilities, where else are your products sold? Is it just a U.S. product? Is this a product that's sold throughout Latin America? Or tell us a little bit more about your your brand footprint before we talk about the farmers. Soli is mostly on the U.S. Uh, it was created as a brand for the U.S. market. Um, 
so and that's why I live here in, in California in the US um, and and the growth has been amazing uh, we we're we just we're just three years old since our hard launch in September 2019 and we're at around 30,000 points of sale so we are at Whole Foods uh, Walmart Target um, CVS, 7-Eleven, and of course, we're at Amazon. We have our own website, uh, Winko, Albertsons. Um, we, we've gained a lot of distribution, and, and we're very, very excited to be the fastest growing fruit snack brand as per Nielsen. And that's because the, the consumer understands it. Uh, we, we have not spent a lot of money in marketing at all yet, but consumer understands it. This is so natural. You, you just try the product, you open it, and you understand what this is. Okay, I have to ask you to emphasize what you just said. Did you just say you're the fastest growing fruit snacks brand in America per Nielsen? Yeah. Okay, you you said that way too humbly. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, wow. Okay. And when you think about that, like I go back to my children are kind of, you know, they've kind of aged out of craving fruit snacks. I mean, um, they're but when I remember back in their like preschool days when it was like all that they wanted and I want, I couldn't find a product that I felt met the values and the demands that I had for food for my children. And so here comes your product as a real solution. So we have four lines of products. I'll, I'll go into the, the fruit snack part. I, we have four lines of products. We started with a fruit jerky. This is one half of a whole organic pineapple. That, that's the only ingredient. And, and we're talking the small organic pineapple. So this is one half of an organic pineapple. And you can see the pieces of pineapple behind it. And then when you open it, the room smells like pineapple. It, it, it's a very unique product. It has one ingredient. It has no sugar added, no chemicals, no nothing. It's it's just pineapple. Uh, this product has been very successful. It, it sells very, very well because once people understand what it is and try it, and it's priced, it's priced very, very uh, aggressively because it's priced... It, it's even cheaper than buying a whole mango. So, so the mango one is a whole fresh organic mango pressed into a strip. And it's cheaper to buy this lorry than to buy a fresh organic mango at the same store. So, and this is convenient and, and you can just take it around. So we started with this line. We have 11 SKUs in this line. We have mixes with banana and cacao to get the chocolate flavor. And we have some chili and salt products as well and we have a cacao drizzled where you can see the drizzle on the back so this is real it, it's not marketing it, it is real it is real that it's indulgent and it's real that it's clean and it's real that it's convenient so talk more about some of the other product lines so that's the jerky line and then what else we've mentioned the fruit snacks so the second line that we have is our gummies or fruit snacks. Okay. So we have four flavors, but this is this is an amazing product because I'll show you the product. Every every little box has five of these. So and one of these, I'll show you the product. So this is two ingredients. It's guava, organic guava, and organic mango and a touch of vitamin C. That's the only ingredients. This competes with the fruit snacks that you're talking about that say they're a lot of fruit, but it's fruit juice or it's a different product. And But this is only organic fruit. And you can see the product, Lori. It's, it's like a gummy. It's like a gummy for children. It's very, very tasty. It, this is a game changer for the category. Is it merchandised in the same area as the traditional fruit snacks? Correct. And, and it's really a game changer. This is a deep change. So all other fruit snacks have 
20 ingredients, some of which are fruit juice or fruit juice concentrate. This is organic fruit, and but children are eating it as a fruit snack. So it's an amazing product and it's organic and it's not apple-based, which there, there's a thing there with apple-based product. So we're very excited and, and it's been growing a lot. We have four products. We have the mango one, we have an orange one, we have a guava, which is my favorite, and we have a passion fruit that I don't have right here right now, but it's it's amazing. The passion fruit is very, very good. So so that's another technology, Lori, that we developed that is very unique and special. And and then we have a dried fruit line on which we have like the regular dried fruit, but mango strips, mango halves, pineapple. The thing about dried fruit is that it, it has had a, a very deep uh, evolution in the last five years. So before that, everyone was buying like the glow in the dark uh, pineapple rings with the crust of sugar. And, and, and in reality, the fruit was just a vehicle to put sugar on, on the product. Uh, then it started changing. We started doing this in Europe first. It, st it started changing to uh, all natural and then to organic. And our, our dried fruit is special because we have the capacity to control the input and the quality of the, of the fruit that we put in first. And then we own our own manufacturing technology to dry the product mildly, not to change the flavor in, in the product or the, and have a very nice texture. So even if it's merchandised as any organic dried fruit product, it's very, very different in quality and it's very special. So uh, we're becoming leaders with organic tropical dried fruit as well. We have many different products. We have things like this that are pieces of dried fruit. This is pieces of pineapple, which is very nice to take with you. Very high added value. This has two ingredients, cacao and mango, no added sugar, but you have the chocolatey texture and flavor of a, of a chocolate but with a mango strip. That part of the business is, is interesting as well because it, it gives the consumer the best quality at the best price consistently. Simon, I'd say you're onto something. I mean, you mentioned previously, uh, you are the, solely is the fastest growing fruit snack um, in America and that's per Nielsen data. So amazing. Um, these All these dried fruit products, the jerky, it's, such great integrity in your food, which is what I love. You know, I'm always, when I'm shopping in the grocery store and when we think about what brands or products we are going to allow even into this podcast, I'm looking for brands that have the integrity of the produce department. And I do think that's the future of food. Um, when I was on your website uh, just a few moments ago, you've got your first vegetable product now also. Is that your your new innovation that's coming soon or is it available in the marketplace now? Soli is a platform. It's a lot more than a fruit snack. It, it's really a platform to leverage all this contact with fresh produce and, and, and farmers and manufacturing and our technology arm to develop technologies to do that. And then the brand to bring that to consumers. So it's a very special platform. So we, we developed a spaghetti squash that is shelf stable. I don't know if you've had spaghetti squash. I, I love spaghetti squash. Did you know that you can cook a fresh one for 10 minutes in the microwave? Oh, really? Please carry on. I, I, you know, you derailed this me is, with my fangirl for spaghetti squash. But yes, I love spaghetti squash. Tell us more. <laughs> this is a shelf-stable version. So this is one one whole spaghetti squash in a box, and it's shelf-stable. So you just have it on your shelf and cook it like a pasta. Put it three, four minutes in hot water and serve it. That's so important for accessibility. Like, I think that a lot of people, whether it's due to knife skills, 
you know, even arthritis or the quality of the knives that you have access to in your home kitchen, like it can be tough to cut through some of those hard squashes. So I love that this product is, is your first vegetable innovation because I think it's just, um, you know, it, it kind of democratizes the access, you know, in a way that, um, I've not seen, um, outside of the frozen foods, but in frozen, it really changes the texture. How is the texture of your product? It's, it's very close to the original because what the technology does is we dehydrate the product without breaking the walls. So basically you dehydrate, you lose the water inside. And then when you cook it, you rehydrate it. So that's that's what the technology does, and and it, it it has basically the same texture, and the convenience is amazing because any dorm room person, any all, uh, senior, you, you just put it in water, and you have your real pasta alternative. This is a vegetable. Is it also just a one ingredient product line? One ingredient, no no preservatives, nothing, and then. The innovation that we just launched is this green banana pasta. Wow, green banana fusilli? The only ingredient here is green banana, which, as you know, it's not sweet. It's a savory product because when, when, when it's green, there's no sugar. You might not know this, Simon. I used to work in wholesale distribution and we had banana ripening rooms like at the Whoa. facility. So um, so the bananas, you know. when they're green, folks, the, the ripening process has not begun and the natural occurring like latex starch within the banana has not converted to sugar. So the banana, when it's green, we were talking about bricks earlier, the bricks count or the bricks number on a green banana is very low. It's a, it's a very exciting product because yeah. if you think about it, it, it look, it tastes like pasta. Yeah. The, the spaghetti squash does not have a pasta texture. It has a, a vegetable texture and a vegetable taste because it's a vegetable. It, it is what it is. Right. The, the banana pasta has a pasta texture. You, you can feel the pasta texture. Mm -hmm. it, it's black, which is cool. But yeah. aside from the color, it's just like an, any regular pasta. You have to cook it in the right way to get the right texture, of course, and that, that's explained in the box. But you're eating a salad instead of a pasta. You're, you're eating organic fruit instead of a pasta. It's not, it's not that I'm just changing wheat flour for corn flour or for rice flour or for, it's a fruit. It's an organic fruit. And that's, it changes, it really changes the nutritional aspect of what, what you're eating. It, it's, it's not a better pasta. It's not a better for you pasta. It's a good for you pasta because you're eating an organic fruit. So right. it's it's something that you and that happens with all the Soli line. They're they're not better for you. We are good for you. It's something that you tell your kid, okay, have another serving. It's not you're not limiting the servings of pasta because this is the nutritious part of the meal. It's not the add-on part of the meal. So right. We just launched it um, a few months ago, and and it's at Whole Foods nationally, and uh, it's doing very good. It, it it's it's exciting. We 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 want more people to try it because it's a paradigm shift. So where's the black from? Is it because when it's heated, the banana naturally turns? brown black or is it is it due to squid ink or what is it when the banana is next to to the air it's it's aired it turns black always and, and what we do Lori, is that we control the process so we don't have parts parts oxidizers and parts not so it's all oxidized together at the same rate so you have an even color always Simon, we've got to talk about your farmers. But before we do that, we're going to take another brief break um, and we'll be right back, folks. The Produce Moms is always accepting new brand partners. If you have a fruit or a vegetable product or a product that has the same integrity and values of fresh produce, we want to help you. Visit theproducemoms.com and in the footer of our homepage, 
please click on the work with us link. We look forward to supporting you. Welcome back to the Produce Moms podcast. This is Lori Taylor, and I've got my new friend, Simon Sakal here with us. He is the co-founder and CEO at Soli. I am absolutely more obsessed with this brand. Um, you know, our mission here at the Produce Moms is to get more fruits and vegetables on every table. And my goodness, what a solution this brand is um, for that, for that living that mission um, in ways I didn't even realize. So I'm learning so much. Um, Simon, you know from you know, our, our earlier in the show, me talking about our B Corp certification here at the Produce Moms. So um, I definitely want to talk about your product sourcing, especially when we consider the parts of the world where you are sourcing product. These are already parts of the world that, um, you know, they don't have the the governance and the access the way that, you know, the regulations that necessarily exist here in the United States around fair labor uh, practices. So I want to make sure um, as my fangirl for Soli is rising, I got to, I got to know more about your sourcing. And I know our audience wants to know more about this too. How are you treating your farmers? How are you treating the farm laborers? How are you deciding upon who you're going to be working with and how are you and in, in the Soli brand empowering the communities where this fruit is grown and sourced? Sourcing, as you might have guessed, is a huge part of Soli. Uh, we took years building the sourcing part because, again, if you have one ingredient products, you have to take care of that ingredient and you have to make it available and you have to make it right. So we we started working with farmers 20 years ago and we started understanding that there's a lot of challenges they face. And that right now our people talk about them here in the US uh, uh, mostly superficially in reality, but there's a lot of challenges because the life of a farmer is very hard. They have a, a, a specific amount of land and then there's seasons where they have a lot of fruit more than what the market needs and then there's a season when, when they have zero fruit and they have to live by what they did before. So planning their future is very difficult. And the only way to sell their fruit is to go to the municipal uh, center and there's people... The, that what they do is buy fruit from everyone around and then go to the markets to sell that fruit, those fruits. So the, the shortest end of the stick is always on the farmer's side because they have the problem. They have either a lot of fruit or zero fruit. So the middleman and, and the market itself is very harsh on them. And and then they cannot plan their future. It's very difficult to plan the future because their seasons, they have a lot of product. Their seasons, they have very little product. So what we do is, well, before that. And then there's another problem that they have. The second problem is that not all of the yield is ready to be sold in the open market. Today, everyone's talking about ugly produce and, and it's all the hype, ugly fruit. And 20 years ago, no one talked about that and no one cared. And it's a huge, huge amount of, of the yield that is not perfect for the market. So as, as you may have explained to your audience many times, the market decides, Lori, what an, a beautiful fruit is and what is not. So in, in, in terms of a mango, it has to be a specific size with a specific diameter, with a specific color, no, no dots, no lines, no nothing. And the blush mangoes always outsell the solid green mangoes, even though there's no, that's not an indicator of ripeness or sweetness, as you and I both know, but the end consumer, you know, doesn't necessarily know that. There's a learning curve with that fruit in particular 
about the the color of the skin on the mangoes. Yeah, but it happens with with every crop. The pineapple, uh, the color of, of the pineapple, the size, even the shape. So naturally, that's ridiculous. Naturally, there is. It depends on the crop, but twenty five percent of the of the yield is not beautiful. Well, beautiful for the market of what the market decided is beautiful. So it's very expensive for the farmer to even cut that fruit from the tree because no one will buy it or, or who, who, whomever will buy it will buy it at a very discounted price because they have the whole problem at the same time. They have all the yield plus the ugly fruit. So it's very difficult to plant. So what we understood is that in order to, to make the playing field, to level the playing field for everyone, we need, we need to help them plan for the future. So the only way to do that is to help them sell 100% of the yield. So instead of going to the open market, we tell them, I will, I will buy 100% of what you get out of your field, which is a huge, huge deal. No one does that because no one uses every type of fruit, every level. every. So that changes the reality. They have almost 70% incremental income because now they're selling a lot more fruit. They, they're sold out before harvest even began, and we help them of course, financially before the yield, the, the harvest starts. So that, that's the first part. And that, that, that has been a huge change maker for, for the industry and, and for the farmers. So that's part number one, which is a huge change for them. And also, Lori, a huge change environmentally, because you're using exactly the same amount of water, land, labor, and resources to grow twice as much uh, calories or fruit. So it's also an environmental thing, a huge environmental thing. Second, we help them get uh, t- uh, convert their crops into organic, which is, as you know, a huge process. Yeah, three years, folks, before you can be certified, USDA certified organic. So what that means is you grow your product for three years using organic standards and farming practices. Most often that is far more, um, that's far more expensive for the farmer, um, which is one reason why uh, organic prices carry a, nine times out of 10, it's a more premium price point than a, than a conventionally grown food. Um, it's because the the inputs for for the farming practice when you're farming organically are more costly to the farmer. So, um, but because there is a three year transitionary time frame that the USDA requires in order to gain the certified organic seal, for three years these farmers must farm organically and then sell the product as conventional because the certification is not complete Um, or sell it, you know, in a marketplace that doesn't require the certified organic seal. And then you're talking, you know, kind of what Simon was saying with the markets and it's just, it's, you're not, it, you don't get your return. Um, So the convert to support the conversion is huge because that's one of the biggest barriers to becoming an organic farmer is that con- that con- that mandated conversion period of three years, and and I don't know if they can necessarily waive that. You know, I mean, it, it, they need that three year time frame to convert the soil and and all of the mediums that that are necessary for the crop to truly have the values that the organic shopper and the certification demand. It's a huge deal. It, it's not only that it's more expensive; you get a lot less yield most of the time. So it's a huge deal. So growing that part has been a huge part of Soli and, and the whole company because it's it's a long-term vision. All the company has been built with a long-term vision, and that's the only way to really do it. We're, we're not the company that 
grows very fast. We are growing very fast, but it's not, it's not that we just buy more product and, and, and then sell the company. We, we are really building something for generations. The whole process of buying and then creating the technology and then building the machines, et cetera. So, but I'll get back to the farmers. So turning them to organic is a huge part. And then we help them also get better yields by better practices, best practices. Uh, there's very little information and there's a lot of confronting practices. So now that we're growing and growing, we know what works, what doesn't, what works faster, how do we get them to get better yields, how to protect the crops. And we 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 help them with that. And we really believe after seeing what some traditional pesticides do to their health, to their specific to our farmers' health, we we really know how deep this goes. So that's that's more or less what we do with with the farmers, which is, and I can talk a lot about what's the environmental and the carbon footprint, but but that encompasses the whole sourcing, and and it's also very difficult because. The U.S. consumer and even the U.S. retailers sometimes they're they're used to having everything all the time. You have a product in a in a retailer, and you you will always have that. And nature is different. Nature has seasons, and and there's seasons for a variety of mango. Then there's a season for a different variety. There's ons and offs, and and better years, and so planning for that and it has been a very big deal and, and, and leveling that production, it has been difficult, but, but we are now in a very good space on that part. Well, and I, I love to hear, um, you know, that everyone's being empowered. I know that there is a lunchbox program in Latin America that provides healthy and affordable fruits for children um, that you had your hand in and you created this program. That came before Soli. That's the way we started working with fruits because first we started working with potatoes and and the technologies around potatoes and, and rice and then like 10 12 years ago we changed to fruit because the government the Mexican government needed a solution to give accessible fruit to children, especially in lunchbox programs within, at schools. So even as you know, in Guanajuato, there is a fruit cart everywhere. Children, unprivileged children in public schools didn't have access to fruit. The, only 20% of the children were eating uh, the recommended amount of fruit in Mexico, which is crazy because there's access. So we invented a technology to make a little bar out of apples, very different from anything that you've seen. We don't have that in, in, in the U.S. market, but without losing any nutrient. So it's a shelf-stable apple. The only ingredient is apple. We can add, you can add nuts or cereals or whatever, but the base is apple or the technology can, can work with local fruits as papaya or sometimes pineapple, et cetera. And it's a huge program. Uh, there's times in the year when we're giving around a million of those little bars, which are a million apples a day to children. And that, so is that a public private partnership that you have yeah. with the government of Mexico? That's amazing. And that yeah. had to also probably be, just foundation, foundational knowledge and experience for what Sully is today, I imagine. It is. It, it was. It, it's the way we started working with fruit farmers. It's the way we started working with fruits and understanding the difficulty with the bricks level that you explained. And, and it, it's a huge deal because children now are eating fruits. Well, in, in many states, children now have, are eating fruit for breakfast instead of sugar-loaded cereals or other types of products. 
So we're very, very uh, excited and, and, and we, we love that product. We're so proud of that program. You should be. All right. So before we close things up, we have a little segment we do with our podcast guests. The one that we're going to do with you is called Produce News Segment, uh, where we actually have come through some of the headlines. And uh, I'm going to read a couple headlines to you and give you an opportunity to to just give off the cuff, you know, response to these headlines. So the first headline comes from the New York Times. Team dietitians are changing how baseball players eat snacks. And then the subheading is, this helps players get through such a long season. Most teams are replacing pregame junk food with macronutrient meals. Dugout candy is now fruit, jerky, whole grain granola bars, honey, sugar-free gum, and water. And then they also say Gatorade coolers. I have my own opinion on that. But I want to know what your, your thoughts are. We know it, you know it, and everyone else knows it. It, it. It's easy to ignore it when you're so busy and, and you're immersed in, in the culture of getting whatever snack is available. But it, it's obvious that the way we have to eat and the, what, whatever is best for us is the way we've been eating for thousands of years, which is the natural ingredients that are available. And... Uh, and every time I, I, there's any article in the New York Times about food, it's scary about what's happening with um, all the, I don't know, yellow 40 last week uh, or uh, titanium dioxide for white chocolate. or It's daunting. So we should be eating clean and we should be eating food that nature designed for us or for living creatures to be to be nourished and even for professional athletes this is performance food it's not just clean food and healthy food it also is performance food and we're starting to see that shift with our pro sports athletes um there was a i can't, I can't remember if it was um which soccer player it was football football but there was a Coke and he, he replaced the Coke with the water. That was, that was tremendous. Um, because you know, that Coke was there probably by proxy from marketing dollars, not, not because it was what he was choosing. And this, 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 this world renowned athlete recognized that. And he knew, he knew like children are watching and he swapped it. I thought it was, I thought it was so courageous and bold and just spot on with where, um, you know, leaders in our industry and in our world need to be as it relates to how are we, how are we role modeling the food and how are we, how, how are we marketing this food to the masses? I thought it was great. Well, love your remarks on that one. All right, here's another one. This, uh, this one was, uh, this came from a web search. This was from a, this was from an eater publication. Is it fruit leather or fruit jerky? Question mark. What's the difference? It's it's very different. Okay. The yeah. fruit leather basically is either the fruit juice or the fruit juice puree concentrated and then cooked. So you get the leathery texture. You, you get a completely different texture than from a fruit jerky. So the fruit jerky is the whole fruit pressed and you can see the pieces and you don't, you don't have the leathery texture. You have more of a fruit texture, paste texture. The fruit leather is tough. That's why it's called leather. It, it's a completely different process. The ingredients are different and, and, the, and the end result is completely different. With that, Simon, the mic is yours for any closing remarks you have. I thoroughly enjoyed this show. I mean, I've learned so much about your brand. I can't wait to um, add a few more products to my Thrive Market uh, subscription. But uh, seriously, thank you so much for what you've shared. Thank you for your commitment to the farmers and, and Mexico, Costa Rica, and the other places where you where you source your products. Um, it really This really is an example, folks, of Yes, it's a food product, but there's a whole lot of purpose, um, and there. This is this is a product that's that's changing the world. Simon, your your work is the work that matters the most. It's making the world a better place, and that is 
that is why you're here with us today on the Produce Moms podcast. So thank you for being our guest today. And by all means, the mic is yours for closing remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you for those kind words. It's very exciting to hear that. And uh, and congratulations to you too, because explaining that to people is the first step and talking about it and, and, and just bringing that forward all the time, that's the way to change the world as well. So congratulations on that as well. And thank you so much for having me. I think people are getting smarter because of you and and those types of efforts. And it's been a practice in the food industry to somewhat deceive uh, what because there's a lot of marketing and and it's very easy to do some research and understand what people want to hear and everyone wants to hear that the product is good for them especially for their kids and everyone wants a very very sweet and and indulgent product especially if it's very cheap as well but people is is getting a lot smarter and companies like us are providing real alternatives that that really solve the problem that 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 are really unique and and you solve the hey i need a fruit snack for my children that that i need that so having something that it's just organic fruit that, that solves the problem or i need something in my purse I, i'm traveling all day and having a fruit jerky that's the way to do it so we we are trying to solve that problem and and i i trust people more and more will start understanding what's happening reading the labels and 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 being more conscious and that will create a better planet all around try try our products they're very very special don't forget to subscribe to the produce moms podcast on apple spotify amazon and any preferred podcast platform check out the produce moms on facebook linkedin instagram tiktok twitter and youtube special thanks to everyone involved with the produce moms podcast my amazing team stay tuned till next time The number one question we get from our audience is, how can I get my kids to eat more fruits and vegetables? One way we can all do this is by making fresh produce fun. Check out our food art gallery and step-by-step guides by visiting theproducemoms.com and searching food art. Because come on, a penguin made of blueberries is just more fun than a bowl of blueberries.